All right, so uh, we'll start by going over the, the warm up and I will share my screen here. And here we go. All right, so this is just kind of reviewing all the stuff we were looking at with second messenger pathways. And again, I just, I'll reiterate looking at the, um, you know, literally we have, we have a zero on here and going all the way up to 100%. You really want to be keeping up. Um, we have our first major exam coming up one week from today. And it's going to include everything up to now, plus a whole bunch of new stuff. This week, we're going to be covering the um, cellular respiration going on in the mitochondria. We're going to be covering how cells get their resting membrane potential. We're going to be talking about the basics of electrical signaling, graded potential versus action potentials and even getting to what happens at a synapse that actually create the graded potentials in the cells. And that's all this week. That's gonna be on top of everything else. So you really wanna be studying and keeping up and making sure that you're solid. So on Tuesday, you're gonna just rock exam one. So let's take a look here. Question. Which of the following breaks down cyclic AMP or cyclic JMP to end the second messenger pathway activity? Um, then here we have most people got this correct. It's, you know, phosphodiesterase, PDE. And we talked about this is the target of Viagra. You know, in order to prolong erections, what you need to do is you inhibit phosphodiesterase, which then means you don't break down the second messenger, which means the pathway resulting in vasodilate, vasodilation and ultimately erection of the penis keeps going. Um, we'll see phosphodiesterase further on down the path. When we get into the um, phototransduction in the rods and cones, you have to understand phosphodiesterase. And so phosphodiesterase will be coming back. Um, give at least two different benefits to using second messenger pathways. Um, again, most people got these. You know, what are some of the benefits? Gives you flexibility. Oh, say it again. Gives you flexibility. The flexibility. You can have the same, the same ligand might end up having different responses in different cells. You know, adrenaline does one thing in your airways, does something else in your eye, does something else in your liver. Um, so you can have the same receptor, but end up having different responses. Um, what other possible benefits can you get? Possibility of control. You get a lot of complicated control possibilities. You've got this idea where one second messenger pathway might influence another second messenger pathway. And it gets really, it gets really um, kind of amazing how much fine control you can have in terms of how the cell is responding in different situations. And then another huge benefit. Amplification. The idea of amplification one receptor binding to a ligand can result in a huge effect in the cell because there's this amplification. You activate the G protein, but then that ends up um, turning on the adenylocyclase in the one example we gave, which created lots of cyclic AMP, but then that cyclic AMP turned on a whole bunch of protein kinases, and now all those activated protein kinases are going to go off and turn on lots of stuff, maybe turn on lots of enzymes that can then go off and do something. So you can get a huge response from a very um, kind of modest initial kind of receptor binding a ligand. Um, and this is where it's important to 
read the question well, especially now that we're thinking about the next, you know, the main exam. The people who missed this um, was mostly because they, you know, instead of giving the benefits, some people, one, some people wrote, like, what are some of the places you find it? Which wasn't the questions. One person gave me examples of second messengers, like cyclic AMP, which again is not the question. So it's can really. Can, sorry to interrupt you. I, at least for my screen, I can only see the first question versus what you're talking about. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. All right. I'd love to be able to follow along. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, hold on. Let's figure out what's going on here. Oh, there it is. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to share again. Okay, now it's moving. If I expand this, does it? It moves. All right, there it goes. Um, so I always tell people when you have a short answer question, it's gonna be a lot of them on your exam. After you answer the question, go back and read the initial question and double check in your head, did I answer the actual question that was being asked? Um, you really wanna do that kind of going back and double checking did I actually answer the question? Because sometimes people will read a question and I boom, write a whole bunch of stuff. And if you go back and it's like, oh, wait a second, I didn't quite answer it the way it was asked. Or maybe I didn't answer it completely. It asked, what is this and why? And I didn't answer the why. So make sure you go back and read the question and double check that you fully answered the question otherwise you won't get full credit. Um, which of the following are important second messengers? So in here, again, most people got this. Um, cyclic AMP is a really important one. Um, this is supposed to be calcium. I'm not sure why it didn't show up here. Calcium is another really important second messenger. Um, a lot of the second messenger pathways that open up ion channels use calcium as the second messenger. Increasing extracellular calcium as a result of a G protein. Again, instead of adenylocyclase, there's another enzyme in the membrane called phospholipase C that gets activated by a G protein and ultimately ends up increasing intracellular calcium, which acts as a second messenger. So calcium is another important one. Cyclic GMP is another important one. Um, again, we're gonna see that when we get to the rods and cones. All ligand-gated channels involve G proteins and second messengers, true or false? Here we got most people got it, but a lot of people said true. Remember we talked about there are channels that are just directly gated like that nicotinic cholinergic one, which we talked about explicitly. You have acetylcholine binds this membrane protein and it is part of the system that automatically opens a channel. There's no second messenger system there. Um, there's a lot of channels that are important that act like that. We call it ionotropic. Um, so a number of important channels just bind a receptor and automatically opens up the channel, which is part. It's this big kind of complicated receptor channel protein. So not all ligand gated channels involve G proteins. Some of them are gated directly. Um, when they're gated directly, that means that there's not a lot of flexibility in what happens. Like a nicotinic cholinergic receptor, which opens up sodium channels, is always going to be excitatory. It's always going to let sodium in and increase the voltage in, across the membrane. A GABA channel, which I'll talk about, if it binds um, GABA, it's going to open chloride channels, let an anion in and decrease the voltage on the membrane. It's always going to do that. So there are ligand gated channels that are directly gated. So you should remember that. Again, there's going to be some important ones that we'll be looking at. 
And then finally, choose all that are true regarding protein kinase A. So turned on by presence of a cyclic AMP. Uh -huh. um, and can phosphorylate target proteins, thereby activating enzymes, et cetera. Again, that's, that's, that's what it does. That's its job. Um, and the rest of the stuff is not true. Um, so are there any questions about any of the warm-up before we kind of continue on here? Okay. All right, so what we're going to do now is continue looking at cells. Let me get my iPad over here so I can draw easier. And you know, while before we totally leave receptors and gated channels behind, I'll add one extra little thing in here. Um, allosteric modulators. Um, I'm going to bring this in particularly because there is a really important class of pharmaceutical drugs that works by changing the activity at ion channels by binding, but it doesn't do it the way we've just been talking about. Um, so I'm going to give you an example. Benzodiazepines. Oops. So the benzodiazepines, you've probably heard of them, the benzos. This is like Xanax, you know, Alprazolam and um, Valium. Um, and what there's one with Halcyon. What are other, what are other benzodiazepines? Clonopin. Clonopin. Ativan. What's that? Ativan. Ativan. Yeah, so these are all benzodiazepines. And they bind at um, these ion channel receptors, but in a different way. So let me explain how that works briefly. So here's my cell membrane. This is going to be my GABA receptor. So GABA. GABA, we'll talk a little more about. GABA is gamma amino butyric acid, which it's going to be better if I just type it out. So this is its official name, but everybody just calls it GABA. GABA is a really important um, neurotransmitter in the body. It's an important neurotransmitter. Okay, hold on, let me not get sloppy here. I wanna make sure the notes Important neurotransmitter. It's just a ligand. You know, it's GABA. It's something that floats around and combines the GABA receptor. You know, the GABA receptor, kind of by definition of, of being a GABA receptor, it binds GABA. 
So here's my GABA receptor. It binds GABA when it gets in there. And when GABA binds, it opens a chloride channel. It lets chloride in. So this is a ligand gated channel, a directly gated channel. Um, when GABA binds, it opens up a channel that lets chloride into the cell. Um, again, we're going to see this in a number of cases as we continue on. Um, the benzodiazepines, all of these drugs, they bind on this receptor, but at a different place. So there is a separate binding site. So when you take this, these drugs, they don't actually act in the direct way we were talking about, like an agonist where it opens up the channel. Instead, what these do, they modulate. So allosteric means changing the shape, modulator meaning it's kind of adjusting things. So when these benzodiazepines bind that site, it makes them stay open longer when GABA does come in. So if these benzodiazepines are bound here and then GABA comes and binds, you'll have more chloride entering the cell. So the upshot is the benzos are going to increase the amount of chloride coming into the cell, lower the voltage of the cell, you know, make it less excitable. That's why these drugs tend to be anti-anxiety and kind of calm you down or put you to sleep because they're allowing more chloride to come into the cell, but they don't act as a kind of more classic agonist. Instead, they bind a separate site on the receptor that modulates the activity. So when it's operating, it lets more chloride in than it would have if there was not the benzodiazepine bound onto there. So does that make sense? Again, these are super common pharmaceuticals. They're used all the time either for anti-anxiety, they can be used um, you know, as part of anesthesia, high doses, they tend to uh, make you forget things. They give you big doses of these before surgery so you can't remember what happened while you were on the table. Um, so you said the benzos keep the channel open longer? Yeah, exactly. When the benzos are bound onto that separate site, then when that channel opens, it will stay open longer than it would have if it didn't have that benzo bound on there. Is it always a one way too? Like, is it always the chloride coming into the cell versus the when binded going out as well? This is going to come in because of the concentrations and everything. We're going to talk about that. You know, the channel is just a, like a window, but the um, concentrations and the electric, the voltage between the two of them, it's going to determine which direction the, um, the ion will flow. And the voltage, professor, inside the cell will diminish, will be, will be lower. The voltage will okay. diminish, will become lower because we're bringing more negative charge into the cell. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. So we're going to see this actually a little later today even, this idea that as you, if you open up a chloride channel, you're going to bring the voltage down. As opposed, if you opened up a sodium channel and sodium came in, then you'd be actually be bringing the membrane voltage up. Um, so that's going to be an important way of when we talk about the graded potentials. You can have, depending what kind of channels you open, you can make the membrane voltage go up or down, depending on whether you have anions or cations coming in or out. 
So, any questions about this idea of allosteric modulators? And again, the main reason, I mean, there are other things that do this, um, but I wanted to give you specifically because benzos are so common. Um, and if you're wondering like, what exactly are they doing? How do they work? They're doing something a little different than the agonists that we had been talking about earlier. All right, so what we're gonna do now is talk about um, cellular respiration. And I think it's useful just as a kind of deep dive into one of the really important metabolic pathways in the cell. Um, it's the only metabolic pathway we're really gonna look at in this much detail, um, but it's, it's useful to understand because it's such a core thing that's going on in the cell for the cell to make its energy. Um, and it's also going to be involved in other pathways. Again, we talked about pathways um, having on ramps and off ramps. Um, so let's do that now. We are going to talk about cellular respiration which you have all heard about. Um, what is the basic chemical formula that describes cellular respiration? Glucose. We've got uh, glucose, C6H12O6. We've got a glucose. Close uh, oxygen. We need six oxygen. oxygen. Six oxygens. <laughs> exactly. And then what do you get? Water and carbon dioxide. Okay. Okay. Six water. Plus and ATP. Yeah, you know, and you get a bunch of energy. So basically, as you break apart the bonds in the glucose. You end up with water and carbon dioxide, but then a whole lot of energy. Right? This formula is just the combustion of glucose. Right? You could light the glucose on fire, and you would have lots of energy, but it would be energy in the form of light and heat. You could warm yourself around it, and you could read by it maybe, but it's not going to be that useful for a cell to do all of its stuff it needs to do. Um, in order to make this useful for a cell, we want this energy captured. It's going to be around 36 or so ATP. Again, we talked about ATP being a molecule that has high potential energy, stores energy in the bonds that you can then release later on by breaking it apart. Remember, ATP becomes ADP plus phosphate plus energy that gets released, which we're going to be capturing to do muscle contraction or pump ions across against their gradient or do whatever, right? So we want the energy from this in the form of ATP. So even though the overall equation looks really simple, the actual process that is going to result in breaking apart the glucose and ending up with the energy now stored in ATP is going to be really complicated. Um, I usually like to start with a Rube Goldberg. Does everybody, do people know what a Rube Goldberg apparatus is? You ever, he was famous for um, creating these ridiculous machines to do very simple things. So I can show you like right here. Um, so for instance, you know, inventions of Professor Lucifer G. Butts. So this is a classic Rube Goldberg apparatus. So basically, this whole machine here is designed to wipe his mouth with a napkin after he takes a um, spoonful of soup from his bowl. And the way it works is he lifts the spoon up to his mouth the spoon is attached to the string. So as he pulls the string with the spoon, it pulls down on this spoon, which flips the cracker up. 
into the air and then the parrot sees it and flies off to get the cracker but when the parrot flies off this lever then the seeds will fall down into this little pail and as this pail fills with seeds the weight comes down and pulls on this lever and that pull actually pulls on the string here pulls on the string which then lights this lighter this lighter then lights the fuse on this little rocket the rocket then goes off and the rocket's attached to this little um, blade here and the blade slices the string here which lets go of the pendulum on the clock which is tied onto the napkin and now the napkin is going to swing back and forth and wipe his mouth. All right so when I think about cellular respiration in the cell this is kind of how I think about it. We are going to eventually end up with 36 ATP from the breakdown of glucose but it is not going to be straightforward. There's going to be so many different steps going on and the energy is going to be in the form of the glucose, but then it's in the form of pyruvates and then it's in the form of acetyl-CoA's and then it's in the form of NADH's and then we're going to use that to pump protons and the energy will be in the form of a proton gradient and then at the very, very end, we're going to have the production of ATP but it's not going to be until we've gone through, you know, what feels like one of these Rube, Rube Goldberg apparatuses. So just kind of putting that out there, you know, and I think, you know, if you think about just kind of evolution, right? Evolution is like, you've got something that works and then there's some mutation and something gets layered on top of that and it's doing, it's working, but it's not like designing something from scratch. It's like however things happen to end up working, then that's what, how it ends up being. And then new things get layered on top of that. And new things get layered on top of that. So you end up with something that ultimately does the job it's supposed to do, but it might be really messy. Um, so let's get into the details of cellular respiration as it actually is going on inside the cell. Okay, so, so cellular respiration. And there's gonna be two parts to it. The first part is called glycolysis. You know, it means kind of breaking glucose. So this happens just in the cytosol. The cytosol, just the, you know, the fluid inside the cell. All the enzymes and everything are just floating around in the cell. This does not need the specialized machinery, the mitochondria, the cytosol does not require oxygen. you know, only results in two net ATP. So the first parts of this don't even need mitochondria, doesn't need oxygen, but you don't make a lot of ATP. You've captured some of the energy, you've made two net ATP. And for some things that will be good enough. When we get into muscle metabolism, um, when we're doing anaerobic respiration in the muscles, it turns out this is fast. You can actually make ATP really fast and we're actually gonna use this in a practical way for like fast twitch muscles. Um, other organisms that aren't as energy hungry as we are, can you do this and that's all they need. If you're yeast, you do this and you make enough ATP to float around and do your, live your life, you don't need to go into cellular respiration necessarily. Um, so we'll talk about that. So glycolysis is gonna be the first part. The second part is gonna happen inside the, um, the mitochondria. We call oxidative phosphorylation. So 
So this happens in the mitochondria, requires oxygens, do, maybe I should say does require oxygen. So by the end of all of this complicated process that we're going to go into, you'll end up with about 36 ATP worth of energy from the original glucose that you were breaking down. Um, we'll talk, you'll see why I'm saying around. You know, a lot of times when you're seeing this written out, it'll say 34 to 38 ATP or something. You'll see that it's not direct in terms of all of the steps. To the energy sometimes is in a concentration gradient, or sometimes actually there's alternate pathways you can take that are gonna be more result in a couple of more or a couple of less ATP for one reason or another. So 36 is the typical amount of ATP you get from the process. So what we're gonna do now is get into the details of this. And we're going to start with glycolysis. We're going to start with this first part, which is happening just in the cytosol. We'll talk about what are the steps, what do you start with, what do you end up with. And then we'll move on into the mitochondria and we'll continue um, if we want to do the whole process to get the full complement of possible ATP from our original sugar. So, and remember for this whole process, at the core of it, it's still, you know, C6H12O6 plus six O2s becoming six H2Os plus six carbon dioxides plus 36 ATP. Um, we are going to come back and we are going to do kind of the basic accounting here. Um, but it's not all going to happen at once. We're going to, again, like in about a half hour from now, we will probably have finally accounted for where, where did the oxygens come in? Where did the waters get produced? Where are the carbon dioxides getting produced? But it's going to be this big complicated metabolic pathway where these things eventually are going to get made when we're done with all of it, the accounting will work out. We'll go check, 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 check. But again, it's not going to be simple. So let's start with cellular respiration. No, blah, blah. Let's start with glycolysis. Um, so this is going to be 10 steps. 10 step metabolic pathway. Again, happens in the cytosol. Doesn't need oxygen. Um, you know, so we say it's anaerobic. Anaerobic meaning doesn't have oxygen. You know, it can happen. There are some things that are kind of obligate anaerobes, like they can only happen if there's no oxygen. This obviously runs with oxygen around. It's just not using up oxygen in the process. Um, obviously, the beginning of our whole metabolic pathway is going to be glucose. So we start with glucose. So glucose is the beginning of this whole thing. You know, step one. It's a metabolic pathway. So then we're going to go to a second thing. It's actually going to be a phosphorylated glucose. Which is basically a glucose with a phosphate group on it. 
Um, what do you need to run from one step to another step of a metabolic pathway? An enzyme. Enzyme. So we're going to have an enzyme. What Kine. Was it? Hexokinase. This means kinase. Remember, a kinase is something that phosphorylates things. A hexokinase phosphorylates a six carbon sugar, a hexose sugar. So a hexokinase, so we have some enzyme. What is the term we use for one of the compounds that's not our final step, it's one of the steps along the way? Intermediate. 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 This is one of my, this is an intermediate here. Um, one of the nice things about having the, phos the glucose phosphorylated, this glucose can no longer go through the carrier. So once it's been phosphorylated, it's trapped in the cell. It's not going to leak out of the cell accidentally. Um, then there's going to just be more and more steps, dot, dot, dot. Okay, you don't need to know all the steps. Again, like I said, there's 10 steps. 10 steps total. And then what you end up at the end of this thing we're going to end up with, we have two net ATP. So when I say net ATP, that's when you do, it's because it actually makes four ATP along the way, but it's using up ATP, like this first step here. When we're phosphorylating the glucose, where do you think the phosphate came from to phosphorylate the glucose? One ATP. From one of the ATPs. So we actually use a couple of ATPs in the process, but we make four. So that's why we say two net ATP. By the time we're done with this all thing, this whole thing, we have two more ATP than we started with. We're going to have two NADHs. Um, again, we've been talking about these a bunch. Again, these are my kind of high energy electron carriers. Remember, I've mentioned before you have NAD8, NAD plus, plus. H plus plus two electrons becomes NADH. When you see NADH in this form, you know that it is carrying two electrons that are at a very high energetic state. And when you donate those electrons, when it breaks apart, those energy and those electrons can be used to do things through, you know, running through these redox reactions. And it would be like if I am carrying something at a very high level, I have a lot of potential energy here. And when I drop them, I can do work as those things fall down. So it's the same thing. When you see NADH, you think about, oh, there is this molecule that has a lot of potential energy to do some work. So it's going to be coming in to do stuff um, as we continue in this process. Um, and we're going to end up with two pyruvates. These are three carbon molecules. So at the end of glycolysis, we started with one glucose with whatever energy stored within the bonds of that glucose. We end up with two net ATP. And so we know that there's energy stored in the bonds of ATP. That's, we've been talking that to death. We have two NADHs, which also have energy stored in them, although not in such a direct way. ATP is like the stuff, right? That's the cell uses that directly to run all the machinery in the cell. The NADH is going to have to be processed more if we're going to actually extract the energy that's in there. And then two pyruvate, and these three carbon pyruvate molecules 
have a lot of energy still stored that can be harvested, which we're going to see, but that doesn't happen unless we go into the mitochondria. So this is the end of glycolysis. Um, at this point, you can actually stop here. Um, and in fact, sometimes you do stop here. Um, if you stop here, sometimes we call it anaerobic respiration. Um, it can also be called fermentation. Um, in this case, you've got these high energy electrons that want some place to go, right? This thing has these electrons that are really like rare to go drop someplace. Um, you can have the pyruvate accept those electrons and creates lactic acid. So you know, if, no, if no oxygen, then the pyruvate accepts the electrons, becomes lactic acid. Um, lactic acid is then going to ultimately end up getting transported to the liver and getting like kind of broken down into other stuff. But so this is one way you can get ATP without any oxygen at all. It's not all that efficient. You only get two ATP for every original sugar. You start building up lactic acid that you got to deal with. But this is going to be an important way to make ATP quickly in muscle cells in particular, we're going to see it. Red blood cells also don't need a lot of ATP to do what they do. And they don't have, we don't, they don't want to be using up the oxygen they're carrying. They can just use this anaerobic respiration to get the little bits of ATP they need. So this is used um, in the human body to make ATP. Um, but it's you know wasting. There's a lot of energy in these NADHs you could have continued to harvest to make more ATP. There's a lot of energy still in these pyruvates that could have been harvested to make more ATP. Um, so if there is oxygen around, what you want to do, and you've got enough time to wait, because like I said, it's going to be one of these Rube Goldberg contraptions, then what we're going to do is we're going to take the NADH and we're going to take the pyruvate and we're going to move it into the mitochondrion where we're going to be doing much more elaborate processes to extract more energy from these things. Um, I should mention before we leave just pure glycolysis here that in the human, um, if you're doing this anaerobic respiration, you know, you make lactic acid. Another um, type of anaerobic respiration pathway or fermentation pathway ends up making ethanol. Um, this is how you make beer and wine, right? If you want to make beer or wine, you get sugar, usually from grape juice or from malted barley or something. And then you add the yeast. The yeast do this. They do anaerobic respiration. Um, instead of making lactic acid, their byproduct of this is ethanol, which is basically um, just, you know, the alcohol, it's like Everclear, basically. Um, and it builds up alcohol in there. And that's why, you know, you get to get drunk when you drink, drink wine or beer, because these little yeasts have been going through this process, um, anaerobic respiration, sugar to alcohol. So this, this can be ethanol in, in some other organisms. Um, yeah, and they typically keep doing this, you know, if you're making beer or wine, they'll keep going until either all the sugar's gone or there's so much alcohol that it's too toxic for them to live. You know, that's, that's kind of why wine ends up around, you know, 13% or something. That's kind of the maximum amount of alcohol before the yeasts die within their own alcohol that they've made around them. If you want to get something that's a little in the stiffer drink, you've got to kind of distill that. And if you want to make brandy or whiskey or something, the, the yeasts can't take you beyond there. Um, so any questions about glycolysis? 
again, happening in the cytosol. All the enzymes that we need are just floating around in the cytosol, ready to grab the intermediate and take you to the next intermediate. Okie dokie. We Can are- a, a side note question real quick. Is FADH used at all in glycolysis or no? No, that's gonna be, we're gonna meet that in the mitochondria. Oh, okay. So yeah, it's gonna be, we're gonna be making more NADH as well as FADH too when we're in the mitochondria. So here we go. Yeah. And I should mention, if we go back to here, so far, if we're doing our accounting, okay, we've broken, the, the, the sugar's gone. The sugar is now on its way. We've got two out of 36 of these. We haven't seen hydro, we haven't seen oxygen or water or CO2 yet. So we still got a lot to go before we've actually um, seen everything that has to happen to do the final accounting for our original formula here. All the rest of this is going to be happening in the mitochondria. So So singular mitochondrion, plural mitochondria. Um, there's, have people ever heard of the endosymbiont hypothesis? Has anybody heard? I see Morgan. What is, so Morgan, what was the endosymbiont hypothesis? Um, basically that at some point there was a, one kind of cell and a separate kind of cell and they got invaginated and became, that became the mitochondria. So exactly. So this idea that some primitive prokaryotic cell was doing its business and it ate some other cell. But rather than just breaking it down and digesting it or doing whatever, it turns out that the cell that it ingested is doing something useful and continue to be actually kind of a, so that's why they say endo within symbiont. This little thing that it ate is actually its partner doing something useful. They work together. The cell helps maintain this little thing that it ate and this little thing is giving something back that the cell can use. So that's how they, there's a lot of evidence that mitochondria originally formed this way. Um, I mean, part of the evidence is that the mitochondrion has a double membrane. And we're gonna see that's actually important in the whole functioning of it. Another piece of evidence that it's originally some separate organism is that it has its own DNA with its own different codons. If you remember from Bio 110, how like, you know, I don't know, I don't remember which codon is which, like AAG might be, I don't know, cytosine and G, I don't know, ATG or what, different, remember different codons give you different code for different amino acids. And so there is a basic code, but the code for the mitochondrial DNA is different than the code for normal eukaryotic DNA. So there's, that's more evidence that these things did not just become like some modification of something the cell already had. It was some alien thing that got taken up and is now considered part of the cell. You know, at this point, you know, they don't live independently. They, they need part of their reproduction as they do it themselves, but part of it is the cell is necessary too. So mitochondria and cells are kind of inextricably entangled now. The nucleus, they think, also became, came into existence a similar way. It's also another double membrane organelle. Chloroplasts in plants, they're pretty sure, are originally um, endosymbionts, a similar way like this. Um, but so mitochondrion, again, double membrane, and we are now gonna look 
in detail of what's going on inside a mitochondrion. But again, we're looking at these little things. And the, the membrane, the inner membrane, is and actually really folded up. So when you see a mitochondrion under the microscope, it looks more like that. And I'm, the thing I'm drawing in yellow is the inner membrane. Thing I'm drawing in blue is the outer membrane. Um, the space in between, they call the matrix. And then there's also this intermembrane space, which is going to be important. Again, in this folding of the inner membrane is going to be important because there's going to, it's actually the inner membrane is where we're actually going to be manufacturing the ATP. So the more surface area of inner membrane you got, the more efficient you're going to be at making ATP. So this idea that if you fold things to increase surface area, this is just another example here. All right, so we are going to now Zoom Sorry, in. Professor Eggert, what is the difference between the inner membrane space and the matrix? Like the matrix is within the inner membrane, and that intermembrane space is between the inner and outer membranes. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, so now I'm going to draw this bigger. So this is outer membrane. So again, my mitochondrion. Here's my inner membrane. Here's this intermembrane space. And in here is what we call the matrix. Do you want to know what it is? What the matrix is the inside of the mitochondria. Um, so now what we're going to do is meet the products from glycolysis, and they're going to come in here. So again, if we go back. You know, these ATP, we don't care. You know, these ATP are already good to go. So we don't, you know, they're already ATP, which is what we want. But the NADHs and the pyruvates are going to be important. So the pyruvates, each pyruvate is going to get transformed into this thing called acetyl-CoA, which is a two-carbon molecule. So let's look at that. Okay, so acetyl-CoA, um, this is another, another um, intermediate. So at this point, maybe I should draw this, it's kind of hard to read with yellow, isn't it? Acetyl-CoA, so if Remember pyruvate, how many carbons did pyruvate have? Three each. Three. So to go from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, you are actually going to lose a carbon. And that's going to come off as a CO2. So how many CO2 get made from the original glucose at this point? Two. I see Maria's fingers go up there. So, all right, when we're looking at CO2, we now have 
two of the CO2s are now accounted for. So we're starting to like find out more and more where is all this stuff connected to cellular respiration in the mitochondria. So two of the carbon dioxides get formed as those two pyruvates get transformed into two acetyl-CoA's. And then acetyl-CoA feeds into this thing called the Krebs cycle. And I'm going to And let me explain how this works. Um, Okay, so this two carbon acetyl CoA comes in, it joins with this four carbon oxaloacetate. To become citric acid, which is six carbon. This citric acid is then transformed into another intermediate, 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 into oxaloacetate at the end of all those eight steps. And then that new oxaloacetate is going to combine with the next acetyl-CoA that's waiting in the wings. And it will go around and do the loop and become an oxaloacetate, which will combine with the next acetyl-CoA, which is waiting in the wings. So you can get a sense why they often call this the Krebs cycle, because the dude who described it was named Krebs. Sometimes it's called the um, citric acid cycle. because it has citric acid as this first uh, main intermediate. Sometimes it's called the TCA cycle. TCA tricarboxylic acid, because citric acid is like three carboxyls stuck together. So TCA tricarboxylic acid, citric acid, Krebs cycle, they're all synonyms for this. Um, So if we're, if we're still thinking about carbon dioxide, um, if we start with a six carbon citric acid and we end up with a four carbon oxaloacetate at the end, that means we've lost two more carbons for every spin. So things that go away when we go through this. Heck. So two CO2s are going to come off. And how many spins do we do for every original sugar? It's going to be two spins, right? Because two pyruvates become two acetyl-CoA's. We get two turns of the wheel, which means that's four CO2's. So if we go back to our original accounting here, ka -ching. was bad. But we basically, we now have six CO2s. These are all accounted for, right? We had the CO2s that got formed when we converted pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. 
And then we may add more as we went from the citric acid to the oxaloacetate. So that is, I should probably draw it one, two, three, four, five, six. That way it won't look as weird. So we have now accounted for all of our carbons. Can you go over the, what happens again to acetyl-CoA combined with citric acid? Yes. Acetyl-CoA combines with citric acid. No, 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 I'm sorry. It combines with the oxaloacetate. The citric acid and oxaloacetate come together to become the citric acid. So basically, like intermediate eight here combines with the acetyl CoA to become intermediate one here. And then it goes around the ring. And then what, what happens when it gets spit out again? Um, at the end of the oxaloacetate, it combines with the next acetyl CoA that's just waiting in the wings to start the next spin of the wheel. The only thing that gets spit out is your two CO2s. That's where the carbon goes. Yeah, the oh, carbon so are getting spit out here. So just the carbon gets spit out. Uh, and more stuff, obviously. Otherwise, this would be useless. So the other things that get spit out here is we're going to end up with two more ATP. Um, two NADHs. Um, no, not actually, not three, three. Let me take care of that. Professor, this is total or pa pair uh, acetyl CoA? Total. No, no. So this is per for each spin. Ah, uh, okay. For each turn of the wheel. Let me write this better. For each turn of the wheel. Um, so we actually have one ATP gets formed. Um, we have three NADHs. And one FADH2, which again is the same basic idea. So this is important. We have another ATP and we have more high energy electron carriers. All right, so at this point, if we're doing our accounting again, two, again, two spins of the wheel from the sugar, we've made two more ATP. So if I go back over to my thing here, all right, my ATP, I made, you know, two from glycolysis. I make two more from two spins of the Krebs cycle directly, but that still means I need 32 ATP. Right, so I'm still missing most of the ATP. So we need to figure out where that's going to come in. And the way we're going to get that is the energy at this point is still stored in these high energy electron carriers. It's stored in these NADHs. We've got at this point from our original glycolysis, if we go back to our original glycolysis, we have two NADHs from here. We have from two spins now six more of over these, and you have two of these because again we've gotten two spins of the wheel for every glucose. So we got a buttload of these high energy electron carriers that are storing a lot of energy in these high energy electrons that we still need to harvest. So the next step is going to be working with that it's still not going to be making ATP directly. So the next thing we're going to have to get to meet is the electron transport chain. So let us meet. So here in, let me maybe make this fatter. So here's my little inner membrane here. And there are special membrane proteins in there called the cytochromes. 
which you will get to know well. So these cytochromes, these are membrane proteins, and they make up what is called the electron transport chain or the electron transport system. And from what you might imagine, they transport electrons. Um, and each one of these cytochromes will hold electrons in a slightly lower energy conformation than the one before. So again, if you want to think about it like the metaphor of gravity, think about I'm holding my folder up high and then I hand it to a little lower and a little lower and a little lower, right? So every time you hand an electron from one cytochrome to the next cytochrome, it gets to release energy as it falls to a lower energy state. So where the heck are we going to find high energy electrons to dump into this electron transport chain? NADH. NADH. Bingo. All right, so let's look at how that goes. Basically, NADH. It's going to break apart and we're going to have two of the electrons that go up into the electron transport system, you know, and the other part's going to be NAD plus plus H plus. So we have two high energy electrons that have now entered into the electron transport chain. And like I said, they keep handing it off from one to the other. So the electron goes, the electrons go through. And again, you can think of it like water falling down a waterfall. And because you have things going from high to low energy, like water running down a waterfall, you can stick a paddle wheel in there or a generator and capture that energy to do something. The energy in this case is going to be used to pump protons into the intermembrane space. So remember a proton is just an H plus, right? If you have a hydrogen atom, which is just a proton and an electron and you ionize it, it's just a pure proton. So we can say proton, we can say H plus, they're synonyms. So this is running, this is going to actually create this major proton gradient. We're going to have lots of H pluses, lots of protons in this intermembrane space. So if we're doing this kind of energy accounting, Right, if we're thinking about the energy, where was the energy? You know, first it was in the glucose. Back. You know, then it was in the pyruvate and the NADH that we made in glycolysis. The pyruvate continued down to get broken apart and we made lots more NADH and FADH2. So the energy now is like kind of in here. First it was here, then it was here. Now it's one, two, now it's in here. And then these using that electron transport system create this proton gradient. Would be like four. So now the energy that was originally it started out in our glucose is now stored in this proton gradient. 
you know, all these protons are sitting on one side of the membrane. They want to come and cross the other one. So we can, again, it's kind of like if you have a dam and you can stick a turbine in there if the, and let the water flow and make electricity for San Francisco. So energy, originally from the glucose through this big convoluted process. Right now, the energy is stored in a proton gradient here. So the final step is going to be another membrane protein in this inner membrane called the ATP synthase. So let's put that little puppy in there. Let me give myself some more room here. This is going to be this ATP What this does is it lets hydrogens come in. but it extracts a price. Again, like having a river flowing down a, or a water flowing down a river or something, and you stick a paddle wheel in there, and then you can turn that paddle wheel and you can use it to mill your grain or do whatever kind of work you want. There is basically a little paddle wheel in here. I mean, it literally is, if you, people who have actually looked at the actual um, molecular structure of this thing. There's actually a physical thing that kind of spins around and moves in here as the protons cross in and it catalyzes the formation of ATP. So that's why it gets the name ATP synthase because basically at this point we take ADP plus phosphate and it turns it into ATP. That is where we're finally going to be um, storing the energy so it is useful for our cells. So if we go back to that, my energy accounting I was doing over here, from the H plus gradient, we finally can make ATP, you know, via that ATP synthase. So that's kind of you know, five, we're finally done. So at this point, if we go back here, we can say, all right, we finally accounted. This is what's going to actually capture the, all the, squeeze the last bit of energy out and make all the ATP. So the ATP is accounted for. The carbon dioxide was accounted for when we looked at making acetyl-CoA and also spinning around the Krebs cycle. The sugar got accounted for at the very beginning, but wait a second, we still haven't dealt with the water and the oxygen. So we still have to see how those fit into our picture. So let's look at that. Like I said, Rube, this Rube Goldberg, right? It's, there's lots going on here. So if we go back to our cytochromes and we go back and think about this electron transport chain, I put electrons in at the top and I talked about how they're, they're kind of flowing like water, flowing down a hill to get to the other end and using the capture of that energy to pump the protons to make this proton gradient. When the electrons get to the very end here, you know, they, they don't just fall off. Electrons don't just fall into space. Electrons have to be accepted by something. What atom has the ability to really capture electrons at a very low energy state? Oxygen. 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 So that's what oxygen's job is going to be here. It's going to be the final electron acceptor. So at the end of this, 
basically you have those two electrons come off of the end plus you know, we're going to say let's say half an oxygen plus two h pluses and what's it going to become water 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 so this last step is oxygen is the final electron oxygen is the final electron acceptor and if you don't have that then the electron transport chain backs up right so that's you know a lot of times if you ask somebody like you know why do you die if you like if how, when you choke somebody to death why do they die or you know, why do you need oxygen? You know, or if I, I should just, let's make it less dramatic. You know, why do why do you need oxygen to live? Because otherwise so, you wouldn't make ATP. Yeah, because it will electrons will build up and yeah, well, otherwise the electrons are gonna back up, you're gonna lose this proton gradient, and you're not gonna make the ATP you need. So ultimately, oxygen is critical for your survival because it is the final electron acceptor that allows this process to continue. Um, I think cyanide works by blocking the electron transport chain. So there's a lot going on here and you don't need to know like the names of all the intermediates of the Krebs cycle or of glycolysis. If you were in a molecular biology class, you actually would have to know the names of all these intermediates and stuff. Um, for our class, you do need to know the, for each step, what are the kind of basic things coming in, things coming out. You do need to know Kind of this energy accounting the energy started in the glucose and then it was in the pyruvate and eight nadh's which you could either just forget about through if you're doing anaerobic respiration or you can bring things into the mitochondrion in which case you've got acetyl coa running through the krebs cycle making more of the nadh the electron carriers and then those are now storing a bunch of energy which you can then feed into this electron transport chain as the electrons fall down the hill so to speak that energy is used to pump the protons to make a proton gradient which is now where our energy is stored and then that energy stored in the proton gradient is going to be used to finally make the atp we want through the use of this ATP synthase membrane protein here. And again, if we go back to our original accounting here, we also see we finally have dealt using up the oxygen to be the final electron acceptor. And part of that process is creating water as the electrons combine with protons and oxygen. So now we're finally done. Pitching. But as you, you know, you can see why I started with that, you know, Professor Butts making the napkin wiper. Because it's, there's a lot going on that's not so straightforward. Um, are there any questions about any of this up to this point? Lauren? Uh, so FADH, um, does that go through the electron transport chain? So it, you can just think of it as just kind of, uh, you know, you know, very similar. It, it does, it's slightly different in terms of its, chem, its chemical structure, but its role is identical. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Professor, me. So we have two NADH from a glycolysis and uh -huh. three NADH for pyruvate, for each pyruvate. And those, the total is going to be uh, the 36 ATPs. So the 36 ATPs. And all the water, sorry. 
I apologize. The six uh, water, they're going to come from there, for, for, from them, from the NADH. Yes, from all of those NADHs um, pouring into the... Um, yeah. Electrotransport change. Okay. Okay, thank you. Could you walk me through the Krebs cycle one more time? What happens when it gets to acetyl-CoA? Uh -huh. So in the Krebs cycle, acetyl-CoA is the thing that is going to be feeding into it. So there is this intermediate that's just floating around from the last spin of whatever else is the last from the ghost of acetyl-CoA past, which went through this. We now have this oxaloacetate, six carbon thing, which is going to combine with this new acetyl-CoA. They become this new citric acid. This citric acid is going to go through eight steps. At the end of those eight steps, all that's going to be left is this oxaloacetate, which is the ghost of that acetyl-CoA that went through. And some new acetyl-CoA is going to come and meet that oxaloacetate and start a new spin of the wheel. So what does the citric acid lose before it goes back to ox oxaloacetate or whatever it is? It, it ends up losing two carbons. Okay. Part of this process, it loses two carbons, but we also make three NADHs, one FADH, and an ATP. All right. So it's not just the carbon coming off, it's the three NADH and the ATP as well. Like that's, that's the kind of main point of it. The, the carbon dioxide is kind of a waste product. Okay. But so, the, um, the NADHs and FADH and the ATP, those are the energy containing molecules that we are, that we're actually, okay. you know, want. So it's a citric acid that's going around and then before it goes back to oxaloacetate, it gives off ATP, carbon dioxide, NADH, and FA. Like these, each of these steps are creating these. If we went into the details, we could look at it in more detail. In your book, it'll show you more detail. So there's kind of like four products coming off of it in the Krebs cycle. Correct. Okay, thank you. I get it now. And it doesn't actually even make it, it makes it, a GTP, which gets converted to an ATP, I should say, but it ultimately makes an ATP. Um, other questions about this? And I should say, even if it makes sense now, review it, because this is the kind of thing where as soon as you walk away, you're going to like, wait, what's going on again? Because um, there's a lot going on. Um, One more quick question um, for the, uh, you said half of an oxygen combines with the two electrons. What do you mean like half of an oxygen for that final step to form the water? An O2. Right? I could just say an O, but since O doesn't really exist on its own, you usually say one half O2. Right? If I, I could say two electrons plus two H pluses plus oxygen becomes an H2O. But typically instead you write one half of an O2. That's just the, the convention. Um, you know, because you don't have just an oxygen floating around on its own like that. Um, before we leave this, I will just mention a few other things that it, glucose, obviously, you used to make ATP. Go back. What if I have enough ATP already? What if you just you ate a Snickers bar? It gets stored. You need to store it, right? So if you already have enough ATP, you can take off ramps. Remember I talked about metabolic pathways having off ramps, like acetyl coas these little two carbon things here. If you've got enough ATP already, instead of feeding it into the Krebs cycle, you can just start assembling these little two carbon acetyl coas into longer hydrocarbon chains and make fat. Right, so let's use make fat, which is stored energy for a rainy day. 
So if you don't need to go through this, you can store it. Um, what about if, are there other things besides glucose that you can break down and make ATP from? Protein and fat. Yeah, protein and fat. Both proteins and fats are um, nutrients you can break down for energy. You know, if I have fats, think of what a fat is. A fat is a glycerol with the fatty acid chains on there. These hydrocarbon chains. This is really easy to feed into this pathway. Basically, you cut these chains off. Glycerol is actually an intermediate already. This just feeds into glycolysis. And these fatty acids, we just chop out two carbons at a time, turn them into acetyl-CoA's, and feed them into the Krebs cycle. Right, so you can take a fat and you just dismantle this thing and it feeds into different parts of this pathway we've already described. The glycerol will feed into glycolysis, as you chop apart the fatty acid chains into little two carbon subunits, you turn them into acetyl-CoA and feed them into the Krebs cycle. And so ultimately make ATP, right? Mm -hmm. um, if we have proteins, proteins are a little trickier. Um, the first step First, you have to deaminate the amino acid. So remember there's, mm -hmm. but then if we take this thing off, we're gonna end up with ammonia, which we don't want, right? We're gonna have, we don't want that. So these ammonias get converted in the liver you take two of them and you put them together, they become urea. Urea is not gonna be react as reactive. It's still gonna ultimately be toxic if it builds up too much, but it basically is gonna go around in the bloodstream where it can then get um, excreted by the kidneys. So that urea, which is one of the big waste products that, you know, this is your classic, what we call nitrogenous waste. It is produced as your body is breaking apart proteins. It deaminates the amino acids, takes these ammonias, and creates urea, which is then going to be able to be removed from the system. So you know, we'll talk more about urea later on as one of the, there's other nitrogenous ways too, whether like, um, the creatinine from muscle metabolism and stuff. But um, really quick, Professor. Uh -huh. um, on the image that you drew of the, um, I guess the amino acid or the, the protein, are there three hydrogen on that nitrogen or just the two now? It's going to turn, it depends what form it's in. I mean, if you remember, you know, if it's, it can dissociate or not. So it can be an ammonia or an ammonium ion. Okay. Um, should also mention the rest of it. The rest of it is going to depend on what kind of protein it is, right? Every protein has different side chains. So it's going to have kind of a unique pathway to break it apart into energy. Right, it's not going to be as straightforward as the story I said for breaking apart the hydrocarbon chains in a fat. Um, finally, carbs. What if I have starch? How am I going to turn starch into energy? Breaking the starch into glucose. Right, you just break it apart into individual glucoses and then feed those in. Right? 
If I have a disaccharide like sucrose, I'll have to break it into monosaccharides and I might have to turn a glucose into a, a fructose into a glucose or something, but it's all pretty straightforward. Um, the last thing I'll talk about before we go on our break gluconeogenesis, which sounds, it's a cool word, gluco, sugar, neo, new, genesis, creation. So this is creation of glucose um, from what you've already got. So the reason this is important is your central nervous system neurons can't work with fats and stuff. They need sh sugar to um, get their energy. You can't, you know, most of your other cells, if you don't have glucose, you can just burn fats and get the energy. Your neurons in your brain need glucose. So if you are on the Atkins diet or on some caveman diet or something, and you're not eating any carbohydrates, your body has to make sugar in order to um, have those neurons have the energy they need. And the way it does it, this is basically um, glycolysis run in reverse. So you know it you have to take some energy but then you just run these things backwards and in the end you end up with glucose. Um most of the enzymes are actually the same enzymes because you know things just go one way or another depending on concentrations. There are a couple of ch differences um in running it backwards that we're not gonna go into. But the basic idea is your cells actually have the ability to run glycolysis backwards if you don't have enough glucose from your diet and you actually need it to um, feed your neurons in your brain. So you should know what gluconeogenesis is. It's basically, run glucose, run glycolysis backwards to make, you know, again, new creation of sugar, you know, by running that glycolytic pathway backwards instead of the way we normally think of it going. So, any comments, questions, or otherwise about all of this? Well, comments, Professor, it's, um, it's the first time I understand this cycle, so thank you. And it's not the first time I started. It was it was different approach and, and it was good. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, I, do, I think it's useful to think about it energetically. It's useful yes, with the equation, it was way easier. Because right, so, it's so easy to get lost in the thicket. Like there's so much stuff going on, so many details. Um, and it's, it's important to kind of step back and remember that it's this big, crazy, complicated way of ultimately harvesting energy from glucose and making ATP. But that there's lots of steps in between. So one question for you, Professor. The cytochromes, would they just be considered transport proteins? Um, no, they're not. I know you said that they're, oh, they're not transport sorry. They're not letting things, they're, they're more complicated. Yeah, I, they're membrane proteins. Just call them membrane proteins. Membrane that proteins, okay. Transport chain. So do the oxygens accept electrons because they have two valence uh, electrons in their shell or how does that work? They have a really low, elect their electronegativity, right? Okay. Remember, you remember electronegativity is like how, how, um, how strongly does something want to like 
pull the electrons to them rather than leave them on something else. Okay. So it, it has to do with the, the, you know, the chemistry of oxygen as a... Well, if the oxygen is negative, wouldn't it repel the electrons? But it's, it's, it, it wants to grab electrons. Okay. Right. It wants two more electrons to fill his valence shell and it pulls them really hard. You can think of something with higher electronegativity is, you know, pulling harder to keep them. I want them rather than leave them with you. Oh, okay. Now I get it. They're, right. they're kind of winning the tug of war or whatever. Um, all right. So, Dagna, but it's late. Let's um, take a half hour break. It's 9.50 at 10. 20 we will continue with so in in order to keep getting through everything i am going to spend i'm going to introduce the idea of resting membrane potential for a cell so before we get to the enzyme lab we're going to do a little bit more um kind of lecture material here because again, thing, things go, things are going slower. I'm still kind of learning how to pace myself in, in the world of online teaching here. So we're gonna continue talking about some just core fundamental stuff about cells that we're then gonna be able to leverage as we finally start introducing the nervous system. And we're, we're getting close to finally starting to dealing with an actual body system instead of just talking about all of this really low level stuff. So, what we're gonna do now is introduce, we've been talking about cells, we've been talking about ion channels and ions and talking about diffusion and voltage and all that stuff. We're gonna like put it all together um, so first thing, we need to just talk about the idea of fluid compartments in the body. You know, right, you're mainly made out of water, but the water isn't all just all smooshed together. There are distinct compartments um, where the water is. So we could say about two thirds is intracellular. So that just means, you know, the cytosol and everything. So about two thirds of the water in your body is within your cells. About one third is extracellular. meaning outside the cells, um, of that extracellular fluid. Um, some of it is just what we call interstitial fluid. So, right, you've got like your cells with whatever they've got in them, but then there is fluid that's just outside that is outside the cell on the other side of the membrane. That's the interstitial fluid. Um, you know, that is, let me make this one. This is about like three fourths of that one third. And what is the other extra cell, the other major amount of fluid in your body that's outside of your cells, but it's not just the fluid that's Blood plasma. Yeah, your blood plasma, exactly. So one four, so about one twelfth of the overall water in your body is like your plasma of your blood. We'll talk way more about plasma when we do the cardiovascular system. For right now, we need to be 
conscious about fluid inside the cells and fluid outside the cells is usually very different ionic concentrations of different ions. Um, this is happening. A lot of it is active. There are little pumps that are running that are constantly pushing things in and out of cells. Um, one of the classic pumps is the sodium potassium pump. You have this pump that's constantly pumping potassium into your cells and pumping sodium outside of the cells. So this is supposed to be a, this is a membrane protein here, but more than just a protein, it's a pump. So it's taking ATP, breaking it apart. So using the energy of ATP to pump sodium out of the cells, pump sodium and potassium into the cells. So we have a major imbalance in terms of the amount inside. Like we're gonna talk in spe the specifics in a little bit, um, but basically like you've got about 150 millimolar potassium in the cell, but only like five millimolar concentration of potassium outside the cell. So it's like a 30 fold difference in terms of the concentration of potassium inside versus outside, about a tenfold difference in the amount of sodium inside and outside. So that is going to lead to some very interesting things. Um, other things, there's, so if we're looking outside, there's gonna be more sodium out here. There's gonna be more chloride out here. There's gonna be more calcium out here inside the cell. We're going to have more um, potassium. So this is going to influence which way things want to move due to diffusion, right? You know, things move from high to low concentration due to diffusion. Um, however, since we're looking at ions, we also have to think about the voltage in the electric field, the electric potential. So you're going to have these two things, sometimes working together, sometimes fighting each other, that are going to influence whether things want to move in or out of a cell. So just kind of starting with this idea, inside the cell, lots of potassium, outside of the cell, lots of sodium. And now, with that introduction, I'm going to introduce two kind of artificial conditions, but you'll see they're actually very useful to think about. And they um, approximate things that actually happen in the, real, in the real cell. So we are going to meet a cell. Let's assume we have a cell that is only permeable to potassium. making little potassium channels here. So this is again, a kind of an artificial situation, but we're gonna see it's actually not that artificial at all. So this is, permeable just to potassium. You know, if the concentrations of potassium inside and outside the cell were equal, then it wouldn't be that big of a deal. Potassium would drift in or drift out randomly because there's no gradient, but there is a gradient. Like I said, this thing's constantly pumping potassium into the cell. We end up having the concentration of potassium ions in the cell is about 150 millimolar. 
the concentration of potassium ions outside the cell is about five millimolar. So that's a huge difference. So if we just think about the diffusion gradient, which way does the potassium want to move? Out. The potassium, the the potassium is going to start moving out. So it moves out due to diffusion. You know, and I'm going to, I'll call this the chemical force. As, a, as we'll see, as opposed to like the electrical force. So as potassium starts moving out, you know, when we first started this whole thing, there was kind of a balance of plus and minus inside the cell. You know, for every potassium, there was probably a chloride or some, some kind of an anion. But as we start getting more and more potassium leaving, we're gonna mess up that balance. So all of a sudden, we're going to start getting more and more positives on the outside and leave a relative negative on the inside, right? So as the, as the positives, if we start equal, but the positives leave, that means the inside is going to start getting more negative than it used to be. So if I take my... If I take my um, kind of voltage meter here, I'm going to start seeing V, the membrane voltage, V sub M, is going to start becoming neg negative. The voltage is going to start going down. It's starting to be, get more negative inside compared to the outside. It's a, does that make sense, that first part? In the beginning, I mean, potassium moves out due to diffusion, but as it moves out, we're going to get more and more of a negative voltage building up. So now I have my little potassium ions. What does a potassium ion want to do if it's the voltage is starting to become more negative inside? Go to inside the cell wants to go inside, make the opposites attract. So all of a sudden, we have an electrical force pulling it back in. So we've got these two things that are fighting each other. The more that we have the potassium leaving due to the chemical force, the more we have more and more of a negative voltage, which creates an electrical force pulling the potassium back in. So do you all see that? So what's going to happen eventually? Uh, potassium will go into the cell and the voltage will become less negative, will go up as a result. So the voltage, but then as it becomes more, then we don't have as much of that force pulling it in, so it wants to leave. So yes. <laughs> that's going to ultimately happen as you just let this keep running. Does it just reach an equilibrium? Exactly. It's going to mm. reach an equilibrium. It's going to reach some point where enough potassium has left that the voltage is just strong enough that it's pulling back with the exact same force that the potassium wants to leave due to the diffusion force. So you hit this equilibrium, this balance where the electrical force pulling in is just balanced by the diffusion force coming out. You know, and that's going to depend on the gradient, right? The stronger this gradient, the lower the voltage is going to get before we finally fight, you know, balance it out. If there was less of a gradient, 
the voltage wouldn't have to build up as much to fight the diffusion force. Does, does, that, does that make sense? So in this case, given a real situation, real cells where outside is five millimolar, inside is 150 millimolar, there is this equation, it's called the Nernst equation. Um, you might have seen it in chemistry. If you haven't seen it in chemistry, you'll probably see it some further down the line or you don't need to know it, but you should know that it's just a simple thing you plug in, you tell it what is the charge on the ion, you tell it what are the concentrations inside and outside the cell, and it will just spit out what is the voltage where that balance exactly happens. So for the case of potassium, the V equilibrium for potassium is around minus 90 millivolts. So if we let the system just run, and we have a cell and we just open up potassium channels all around it and let it hit an equilibrium, will finally be in balance when the cell has a membrane voltage of minus 90 millivolts. So the, the concentration gradient, it's inverse or negative proportional to the voltage because it goes more negative, it goes down. If the gradient is major the difference the the voltage will be like more yeah, negative yeah it will yeah if, exactly because you'll have to have an even stronger voltage to fight back against it okay okay thank you so so are there questions about this this is my artificial situation of a cell purely permeable to potassium which is yeah okay so I'm going to do the same thing for a cell that's solely permeable to sodium. And do this a little faster because you've got the basic idea. Um, the big difference here is the concentrations of sodium, we said, is much higher outside the cell. So outside we have concentration of sodium is around 150 millimolar. Inside the concentra concentration of sodium is about 15 millimolar. So it's still a cation, but now we have a much higher concentration outside the cell than inside the cell. So which way does the cell, is this a cell, does the ion want to go just due to diffusion? In. Wants to go in. So now we have our diffusion force going in. But as we get more and more sodium coming in, leaving a relative negative on the outside, my membrane voltage here, V sub M is going to get more and more positive. Because the more we have the cations coming into the inside of the membrane, that's kind of by definition, we're getting a positive voltage across the membrane. So as it becomes more and more positive inside, what is the electrical force going to do to the sodium ions? Um, going to want to push them out. Yeah. 
because now it's more negative outside compared to the inside. So the sodium wants to leave due to the electrical force, but it wants to enter due to the diffusion force. So it's the same basic idea, except things are just flipped around because the concentration gradients are, are the different way. But it's gonna be the same idea. There's gonna be some balance where enough of the sodium has come in and made it high enough of a positive voltage in here that we build up enough of an electric force balancing it out, pushing back out, that it's in equilibrium. And we get a V equilibrium for sodium is going to be about plus 60 millivolts. Again, this is just that place where the diffusion force and the electrical force balance each other out. Um, the questions about this one. Okay. So now we'll just put these together and we'll see how it all works in a real cell. And a cell at rest, I should say. And in particular, right now I'm talking about excitable cells like neurons and muscle cells. So membrane, mainly permeable, to potassium. So what does that mean in terms of the resting? So V sub rest is going to be about what? Minus. Minus 70? Mi so minus 90. 80. For so potassium is. Right, so it's, it, and it's not going to be all the way down to minus 90 because the cell does have other channels and other ions crossing, but it's close. So it's, in general, it's around minus 70 millivolts is a, a typical resting voltage for a cell. This is typical. But it's really easy to f make the voltage go up and down by opening and closing gated channels. So if I have my cell and all of a sudden I open up a bunch of sodium channels and I basically, I can make it very similar to this situation and all of a sudden the voltage is gonna go up and all of a sudden it's gonna be closer to this. Maybe it'll, maybe not all the way up, it'll go up to plus 40 or 50. And then I close those sodium channels and bing, I zip it back down and now I'm close to the potassium when I'm back towards my resting. So this is gonna be a major way you do signaling in these excitable cells is open sodium channels, the voltage goes way up. Close the sodium channels and reopen the potassium channels and the voltage goes down. So does, does that make sense? This is going to be at the core of all the signal, like the action potentials and things like that. So, so the voltage goes up because the sodium came into the cell? Correct. Okay. So basically, if my cell is normally like this picture here, primarily permeable to potassium, but all of a sudden I make it look more like this, mainly permeable to sodium, all of a sudden the voltage is going to approach that. So that's at the core of things, something, things to remember. Um, what else? Some words, some words that are useful. Um, 
when Vm goes up, you know, you know, above V resting, we call that depolarizing. Depolarize. I cut myself depolarize. When VM returns to resting, then it's repolarize. When VM goes below resting, hyperpolarize. Um, hyperpolarizing is pretty easy to understand. Um, the basic idea there, you know, I said in a cell at rest, mainly permeable to potassium, and I said it's around minus 70. What we do is we just even make more potassium conductance. So we bring it even closer to that minus 90. So it just, it goes even lower than minus 70. So you can hyperpolarize a cell just by increasing the amount of potassium conductance in the membrane. So, so are there questions about this core idea of membrane potential? All right, so the last thing I should mention about it, you can go from like plus 50 to, you know, minus 70 up to plus 50 down to minus 70. Just again, by opening and closing the appropriate sodium channels and potassium channels. Um, but the amount of ions that actually move to make that membrane voltage change like that is pretty small. Like in general, the cell is filled with pluses and minuses. And the stuff that is moving in and out to change the voltage is happening right near the membrane but it isn't appreciably changing the overall concentrations of the ions, right? So if I have my voltage flipping up and down, it's not messing up, you know, it's still, you know, gonna be, you know, potassium concentration is five millimolar outside and 150 inside. It's gonna change a little bit. Obviously, if ions are moving in and out, it is going to mess with the concentrations, but it's not by much. And you have to have it flip a lot before it appreciably changes the concentrations. And then I've constantly got these pumps coming along that are always rebalancing things and making sure we don't lose the concentration gradients. So you just always assume that the concentrations are saying staying pretty balanced, even though you have you have um, ions moving in and out of the cell to create these voltage swings. The amount of ions moving is pretty small compared to the entire number of ions. Um, so th th does that make sense? All right. So I think that that's what I want to. That, oh, let's leave it there for now. Um, questions about how a cell comes to a resting voltage that's not zero based on the concentration gradients or how we can flip the voltage just by changing, you know, opening and closing gated channels and changing what conductances are, which condition we mimic. Is it mimicking the potassium conductance condition or the sodium conductance condition? So sodium diffuses into the cell because there's less sodium inside the cell. Correct. 
Yeah. And then also in a cell at rest, when it's minus 90 at rest, which, so if I have a cell at rest here, and so I also have sodium outside, 150 millimolar, sodium inside is 15 millimolar. And then I open a sodium channel. It's got a gate and I open it. Which way does the sodium want to go? Into the cell. It so wants to go into that cell, right? It's got a concentration gradient where it wants to go in. It's super negative inside, which means it wants to go in. So in this case, when you open a sodium channel, there are two, both the, 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 the chemical force and the electrical force are both totally pulling that thing in. So they just totally fly in and start bringing the voltage up. You know, even after the voltage becomes zero and then becomes more positive, they keep coming in because of the diffusion gradient, right? So they're not gonna, it, they'll keep coming in even after it starts becoming positive here because this diffusion gradient is driving the continued movement of sodium into the cell. That's why we don't stop until we get, you know, plus 50 or something in there. Plus 50 millivolts, I should say. So, So I'm under a little Mr. Lightning Bolt says, all good? And what conditions lead or cause hypo or hyperpolarization? Typically opening and closing different gated ion channels. So we're going to be looking at that more explicitly on Thursday. Um, it can happen like because some neuron is talking to another neuron. I remember we talked about, you know, ligand gated channels. So like some channel just got a message from GABA or serotonin and that caused the opening of sodium channels or chloride channels or something and that's going to change the voltages. Or when we see action potentials, there's going to be these chain reactions that happen due to voltage gated channels in the membrane. So, and would it be more positive ions on the inside would be hyperpolarization? Um, hyperpolarization can happen in different ways. Hyperpolarization can happen because you have more positive leaving or because you have negative entering. Okay. Right? All, either one thing that makes it more negative you can get make things more negative by either kicking out some of the positive that's there or by bringing in additional negative. So either one of those conditions could result in hyperpolarization. Right, does that, does that make sense? Yeah, thank you.